Lau, in terms of how the survey was conducted, um, it was based on self-reporting by these individuals, correct? Uh, survey studies are self-report studies. By I nature. Mean, it means you ask people a question and they answer, and right. this is no different. Correct. And like all, stu that like all surveys then, they are open to self-reporting bias, correct? Trust that people tell us, you know, uh, uh, honest answers, and, but they're, you know, they're telling us. We're taking their word for it, and that's kind of the nature of doing that kind of research. And we don't know from the face of this document what, if anything, was done to control for possible self-reporting biases with this survey, do we? I don't believe they discussed that issue in this report. And so to the extent that it may be more representative of individuals who are happy with their marriage than the average, we, we have no way to know that, do we? Well, you know, we, in general, relationship researchers have worried about this question, about if we ask for volunteer samples for a study, are we more likely to get happy couples who want to brag about their relationship or miserable couples who want to complain about their partner? And, it really seems very plausible that you can get both. And uh, in, th in this case, we really don't, uh, we don't know. But we do know that the recruitment came through a gay advocacy organization, correct? Correct. And we do know that 40% of the respondents to the survey identified as one of the top three reasons they got married, having their relationship more visible, gay and lesbian relationships be more visible, correct? Right. So, it, you know, so the debate about same-sex marriage is something that is widely talked about in this country and in gay communities. And so it wouldn't surprise me that in a state that is... Uh, one of the first states to permit same-sex marriage, that it would occur to same-sex couples, particularly those who are more socially engaged or active, that part of what they were doing was participating in a private activity that was going to be known to other people. So um, it, it doesn't particularly surprise me that they might have given that answer, given the social climate of the times and the novelty of marriage for same-sex couples in Massachusetts. And so that it, those facts tell us about something about the individuals that chose to respond to the survey, or they may tell us something about the individuals that chose to respond to the survey, correct? They tell us about the experiences reported by the people who took the survey, yeah. Now, Dr. Peplow, on direct and in your expert report, um, you've offered the opinion that in your view, allowing same-sex marriage will not harm heterosexual marriage. And you specifically have focused on whether it'll cause increased divorce rates, isn't that right? That was one of the things I talked about, yes. You have not um, offered opinions or undertaken a extensive analysis about whether or not it might harm the institution of marriage separate and apart from individual heterosexual couples relationships. Isn't that right? Issues I have been centrally interested in are entry into marriage and exiting from marriage through divorce or dissolution. I think those issues speak in very important ways to the institution of marriage and its health and how robust it is, but there are certainly other aspects of the institution of marriage that I do not uh, address in my expert statement, um, and that's true. Now, Dr. Peplow, I want to direct your attention for a moment to the statement you make on page 11 of your expert report, and you can find that behind tab one in your binder. Okay, and it's page 11, did you say? Page 11 of your expert report, and it's tab one. Okay. Specifically, I'm looking at the second paragraph under the heading, the A heading. Um, about halfway down, you, you write, 
public acceptance of divorce has increased, as has the social acceptability of unmarried cohabitation. Some scholars also suggest that a growing emphasis on individualism and personal fulfillment has eroded an earlier emphasis on the importance of obligation and commitment in marriage. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Okay. And another reason you cite that contributes to the current divorce rates is that state no-fault divorce laws make it easier for spouses to end their relationships, correct? What I was talking about here was um, analyses that family researchers and historians and sociologists and others have done to try to understand factors that led to an increase in, a dramatic increase in the 20th century in the divorce rate in the U.S., a divorce rate that peaked in the 80s and has kind of leveled off or decreased since then. So this is really an analysis of um, factors during a, a reasonably long period that contributed to uh, a fairly high divorce rate in the United States. And, and those factors include a growing emphasis on individualism and personal fulfillment? That's one of the factors that's been suggested by, uh, by scholars who have, who have studied this. And part of what they have suggested is that in, in earlier times when a more important part of marriage might have been marriage as an economic unit in which um, two people came together as a way sort of, you know, to meet basic needs for, uh, for survival, that over time we have come to expect personal fulfillment through marriage, that marriage is not only the place where our laundry is done and someone pays the bills, but marriage is also the place where we uh, develop our personal potential and so on. And it's been suggested that this uh, increasing in emphasis among some individuals in what's been called individualism has in some ways set very high expectations for marriage. That now it's not enough for a married partner to treat you well and be kind and thoughtful, but uh, you have to also be able to develop a relationship in which you find your soulmate, in which... Uh, so the suggestion has been that uh, shifting American values about individualism may have been one of many factors that contribute. And the reason I talked about these factors was because none of these factors is linked uh, or is due to the gay civil rights movement. That was really the point I was, one of the points I was trying to make was that the increase in the divorce rate was independent of uh, the push for marriage equality for same-sex couples. Now, looking at turning to page 13 of your expert report where you have a chart that um, I think lists or sets forth the divorce statistics in Massachusetts that you, were, that you spoke of on direct, um, you have four years' worth of data listed. Is, is that right? The four years before uh, same-sex marriage and then the four years and the starting four years with. after. Yeah. And you would agree that this is not a tremendously large amount of data from which to draw conclusions, isn't that right? Um, it, it, it's a total of eight years of data. You know, that I don't know what large or small would mean in this capacity. It's only four years since uh, marriage began because that's, those are the most recent government statistics available. And as we look at them in Massachusetts, we see that in 2004 of all of the years listed in 2004, there was the highest marriage rate, correct? 6.5%. Correct. correct. And it went down in 2005 to 6.2%. Yes. And it went down to 5.9% in 2006, stayed at 5.9% for 2007, and we don't know 2008 and 2009 based on the evidence that you've put in. Isn't that right? What, what I would, your reading of these numbers is quite correct. And what I would comment about is um, that if you look at these kinds of data, not just in Massachusetts, but in other states, what you see is that there are always year-to-year -year minor fluctuations. 
And so that's why when I looked at these data, um, my interpretation of them is really an interpretation of no change because the fact that the rate goes up 2% one year, but half, 0.2% uh, one year or down, you know, a, a small fraction of a percent the next, I think is just kind of haphazard variation in the data. And I don't uh, take those as uh, necessarily serious uh, indicators of anything. To me, these pa the, what stands out to me is, aside from what looks like the impact of gay people getting married the first year, increasing that number, the numbers just kind of look the same to me. And have you undertaken a comprehensive analysis of the marriage and divorce rates in the neighboring states to Massachusetts? No, I have not. How about nationally? You've not done a comprehensive analysis of what the divorce rates uh, during this time frame were nationally either, have you? No, the only point I was trying to make here was that Massachusetts is a state that permits civil same-sex marriage and that it would be informative to look at in that state what the patterns were leading up to prior to same-sex marriage and, and following. I don't make any claims beyond that about what these data show. And looking just for a moment at the divorce rates starting in 2004, uh, the year that same-sex marriage was allowed in Massachusetts, the data as you present it, 2.2% in 2004, 2.2% in 2005, 2.3 in 2006, and 2.3 in 2007. So going up slightly in 2006, 2007, correct? And still winding up lower than they had been in the four years preceding the introduction of same-sex marriage. So, I mean, I, we can try to make something out of a difference between 0.3, you know, 2.3 and 2.4, but I think given the fact that these numbers bounce around a little bit in all states across years, that um, I was certainly not claiming that the divorce rate went down as a result of same-sex marriage. But if we want to look at minor variations in divorce, uh, the average divorce rate is lower after same-sex marriage than before, but I interpret it as really the same. And, and again, I don't know if it shows a pattern or not either. We have four years, and you would agree, you've got four years, including the year when same-sex marriage was allowed in Massachusetts, and we have that year through 2007, and that's the data that we have. Correct. And you would agree that it would be helpful to have several more additional years worth of data to be able to draw conclusions one way or the other, wouldn't you? I'm sure we will have those data soon. I'm sure we will. And just to finish up, Dr. Peplau, as to whether same-sex marriage will have any effect on public attitudes towards individualism or commitments over time, you can only speculate about that issue because you have not actually done any study of it. Isn't that right? So the issue is, do I think that, um, I'm sorry, it may be late in the day. Could you repeat the question? Sure. Whether same-sex marriage will have any effect on public attitudes towards individualism or commitment over time is something you can only speculate about because you have not studied it and know of no studies. Isn't that right? So the question is, do I think that permitting same-sex marriage might over time lead Americans to become more or less individualistic? Or do I think it might lead them to value commitment more or less over time? Is that the question? Well really have you studied that issue so where you can offer an expert opinion on it? My general opinion, my overarching opinion, that same-sex marriage will not cause harm is based on my consideration of a lot of research on marriage, on same-sex couples, our understanding of theories and so on, and all of the evidence and the theories I know and can think of are on the side of saying no harm. And then on the side of what theory might there be about why there would be harm, or what data might there be to suggest harm, there's nothing. So it's kind of like 
this. And so I have great confidence in that conclusion, but it is the case that that, that that opinion of mine is not based on my having done an empirical study over time of how same-sex marriage will or won't influence the public's attitudes about individualism or commitment. Thank you. Very well. Any redirect, Mr. Dassault? Kind of very briefly. <coughs> Dr. Peplau, uh, Ms. Moss asked you some questions at the beginning of cross-examination about enforceable trust and whether there was enforceable trust in a domestic partnership. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Do you have a view as to whether there's a greater degree of enforceable trust in a marriage than in a domestic partnership? I think it would be greater in marriage. Ms. Moss also asked you about barriers to exit and whether there were barriers to exit in domestic partnership. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Do you have an opinion as to whether there are greater barriers to exit from marriage than from domestic partnership? I believe there are greater barriers in marriage. Ms. Moss asked you about a piece of work from 1985 that's at tab four of your binder, exhibit 1233, talking about exclusivity, you recall Yes. That? So that's something that was done 25 years ago? Yes. And 25 years ago, there was no marriage available for same-sex couples, correct? Correct, nor were there domestic partnerships. So any information that you gleaned in that study had nothing to do with the behavior of couples in marriages, correct? That's correct. And do you know, in California, is there any restriction on the ability of a heterosexual couple that doesn't want to be exclusive to marry? No, there is no restriction. Um, I'm a bit reluctant to take you back to Belgium, but I had one question. <laughs> uh, actually, maybe two. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we start with the U.S.? Why is it that you focused on the U.S. rather than uh, other countries? We're talking about uh, possible changes to the law in California and in the United States, and it seems to me that the most directly relevant information is what's happened in another state within our own country. Well, Ms. Moss asked you about, it was a hypothetical, but there were some figures drawn from data where she was suggesting that 43% of heterosexual couples in the country were married and 5% of same-sex couples were married. Do you have any idea in that hypothetical or that data whether the 43% of heterosexual couples included all the heterosexual couples that had been married and all the time that heterosexual marriage had been allowed? My understanding, but I, I don't trust it, is that it's, it was really the percent of individuals who are currently married. And do you know how long opposite sex marriage has been lawful in the Netherlands? I or assume Belgium? for a long time. Uh, Ms. Moss asked you some questions about a, a growing emphasis on individualism and personal fulfillment. And sometimes that's put in contrast to, let's say, uh, concern for child welfare. Has your study of relationships, Dr. Peplow, suggested in any way that same-sex couples have a greater emphasis on individualism and personal fulfillment than opposite-sex couples? No. Has your work suggested that same-sex couples have any less concern for the well-being of children they may be raising than opposite-sex couples? No. Lastly, Ms. Moss asked you some questions about Massachusetts and the need for some more data. Do you feel that you need more data from Massachusetts to form an opinion as to whether allowing same-sex couples to marry would either lead heterosexual couples not to marry or to exit their marriage? I don't, because my opinion is based on so much more than simply the Massachusetts data. Thank you very much. I have no further questions, Dr. Pepper. Very well. Ms. Paplaw, you may step down. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Your Honor. And um, we're, I think, ready to adjourn for today. And we'll recommence at 8.30 in the morning. As you may know, the Supreme Court's given us some guidance with respect to uh, part of the issue. It seems to be a rather limited uh, guidance at the moment. And uh, so <clears throat> we may have uh, issues beyond um, remote access. Uh, 
to uh, these proceedings by other courthouses that we'll have to take up at some point. My inclination uh, with out hearing from counsel and getting their advice is that we put that issue to the side for the time being and proceed with the trial. We seem to be moving along well and I don't want to do anything to uh, alter the progress that we're making in these proceedings, but we may indeed have to address uh, those issues at some later time. So we will not have remote access uh, to these proceedings from other courthouses in the Ninth Circuit and elsewhere in the federal judiciary, but uh, we'll have to deal with the other issues in due, in due time. Uh, now, Mr. Cooper, I understand from the clerk that you ask about uh, the responses to the proposed uh, or the change in the local rule and the responses with reference to uh, broadcasting or webcasting these proceedings. And the ones that we've received are all in the uh, jury room. I believe you or your colleagues have had an opportunity to review them. Is that correct? Uh, I do understand uh, that, that they're in the jury room f available for inspection, and I believe that some of my colleagues have, uh, uh, have, have taken advantage of that fact. I don't have a report for you in terms of whether, whether that, uh, that review is complete. But, uh, well, there are quite a number, uh, quite a number. That's, that's so I can well imagine that maybe you haven't or your colleagues have not had a chance to review them all. My understanding from the clerk was that you or someone on your team had requested to copy some of them. Um, you're you're, you're uh, better informed than I am. I, I see. I, uh, well, maybe, maybe you should uh, chat with your colleagues. Um, my initial reaction is I'll be guided by whatever you advise. Uh, I'm inclined to think that we should either copy all or none um, or make, make them all part of the record if that's necessary. But in view of the volume, I just really wonder what value they may have for these proceedings. But uh, Well, the court, the court has put on the record uh, the selection of the comments that the court well, but those are for relevant. organizations. Those are uh, lawyer organizations, and I put all of those on, but uh, none of the individual comments. Well, uh, I, I, I frankly don't know what's, what's in this. I haven't, I haven't received a report, uh, but uh, if, if we do uh, conclude that there's something in those comments that, that uh, we would like to ask the court to put on the public record, we'll, we'll, we'll try to make that determination promptly. All right, that's fine. Anything further at the moment before we adjourn, Ms. Uh, Stewart? Your Honor, if I might, I, I wanted to make sure that the excerpts from the TAM deposition that we played this morning did get in the record. Um, I know that, uh, or I'm told that they weren't actually transcribed, and so I know we didn't complete them, but insofar as we got partway through, I'd like to make sure uh, those deposition excerpts are part of the record and the documents that were with them. Well, it would be helpful if you would supply the page and line uh, reference to uh, those depositions so the reporter could note that in the record. We'll happily do that, Your Honor. I'll do that first thing in the morning because I need to check how far we got with my colleagues. All right. If you can check on that as Mr. Cooper is checking with his colleagues. Um, who's our first witness tomorrow? I beg your pardon? Mr. Egan. All right. And... Uh, He'll be followed by Dr. Elon Mark. All right. And uh, <clears throat> suppose we can get through three of these folks tomorrow at least. <laughs> we, we believe we will, Your Honor. All right. Who's the third one then, Mr. Boyce? Uh, we actually hope that those three will not take the whole day. We're trying to move as quickly as possible. Uh, Ms. Zia, you mentioned. Okay. And um, good. Well, that would be good progress. And um, we're, we are moving along, which is what we all want to do. 
All right, I'll look forward to seeing everybody at 8.30 tomorrow morning.